So my good friends Cliff and Cajun just basically have finished building out their incredible new studio. Thought it'd be a cool opportunity to test out B-Script's brand new 1.55X Anamorphic Mark II. Let's go check out their new studio, let's check out the new anamorphic lens, and uh, see what cool shots we can get with it. So first things first, in this setup, we're starting off with, of course, my iPhone 14 Pro Max. And because I want every shot to come off of the best sensor, we are using the standard wide 24 millimeter lens. Of course, everything's gonna be sitting inside the brand new beast cage for iPhone 14 Pro Max. If you've never seen these before, they're absolute tanks, full metal. Putting your phone is super easy. You simply just pinch and pull off the front plate. Toss in your phone to the padded edges so nothing's getting scraped. Throw back on the front base plate and hear that satisfying snap back into place. And by the way, you can change the lens mount to utilize either the wide or telephoto lens very easily on the back. But again, I'm not a huge fan of the telephoto sensor, so we're sticking to the 24 mil. Of course, we're gonna add on the brand new 155X anamorphic lens. Once you screw it on to the lens mount, you simply just rotate it to adjust to make sure that it's straight on. Now, B-Script does have a handful of handle options that you can pick from if you're going handheld, but for most of these setups, I want it to be incredibly smooth. And since you need stabilization turned off, which we'll talk more about in a few minutes, I definitely wanted to use a gimbal for all these shots. And the Crane M3 is by far my favorite mobile gimbal setup. Because this is a heavier mobile setup, a gimbal like this can easily handle the weight and still give you all the great features. It's compact. It's just all around my favorite small gimbal. And so in past videos when I've shown off anamorphic videos, uh, we've kind of talked about it like it's your A cam for any mobile filmmakers. But today, I kind of wanted to just come over and do more behind the scenes and showcase why a mobile phone setup like this and even using an anamorphic lens will give you some really cool behind the scenes shots if you're just kind of an extra person on a film set, filming your friends, content creators, all that good stuff because you can just get in some incredibly small spaces without you know, getting fatigued at all. So if you wanna shoot anamorphic using your phone, there are a couple special notes you should probably take before you do so. First of all, probably the most important rule is to turn off stabilization in whatever app you are using. The way the optics work with the de-squeezing and squeezing thing, some pretty insane jelloing happens when you use an anamorphic lens and optical or digital stabilization on phones. So if you want smooth shots, make sure you grab a gimbal. Even if you do not have a gimbal, shoot handheld with it off and then apply stabilization in post and you will get much better results. Anamorphic lenses also have pretty gnarly distortion depending on how you frame your subject. Take this curtain rod for example. When placed at the top of the frame, both the rod and the actual corner of the wall, you can see look very much curved, but as soon as I bring it to my middle horizon line, all the lines straighten out. And finally, know your minimum focus distance. This lens is around three feet, which is pretty common for anamorphic lenses. But if you're like me and you really love close-ups and shooting tight, there is an accessory that B-Script told me about that definitely saved the day. One of the solutions that B-Script actually told me about was using diopters. Specifically, they told me about this one. It's just, I'm sure there's a million of good ones out there, but Provesian on Amazon, it'll be linked down in the description below. It's only like 20, 25 bucks. Comes with six different various strengths of uh, changing the focus or diopting, whatever the word you would use is. And the ones that seem to work best for this lens are plus two and plus four. I've been mostly exclusively using plus four, so any super close-ups you see in this video are pretty much the plus four. You go beyond that, you can get even closer but the fringing starts to get pretty intense. The one downside to it though is it 
doesn't then allow you to focus from far away things. So if right now I want to get a wide shot of the room here, I need to actually take this off and then grab my wide shots and mediums and whatever. But as soon as I want to go closer than the three feet minimum focus, get some cool close-ups, then I need to throw it back on. And so I could see that being a potential kind of deal breaker or at least pretty big con for anyone constantly taking it out in and out of uh, your pockets. Maybe I need to ask Cliff to 3D print another uh, holder like they have for their lens claps, for their lens caps. Wow, brain broke there. Doing a very quick diopter test in my studio with a simple backlight setup. You can see that without any diopter, there's basically no fringing and everything looks nice and sharp, but of course the subject has to be about three feet away. Once we start adding the various levels of diopter that this kit comes with, the plus two and plus four definitely allow you to get a much closer focusing distance. Once you go up to the plus eight and plus 10, you can definitely get closer, but you really start to see the quality loss as well as the extreme fringing going on. Depending on the situations, you may not notice the fringing that much. In the sample footage that I shot of Cliff and Cajun, there are definitely clips where if you look in the background and you pay attention to it, you will see a healthy amount of fringing and these were all on the plus fours. But to me, for the types of shots that I got, it was worth it. One of the biggest physical differences from this lens compared to previous generations is it used to be a 58 millimeter design, but they were getting some vignetting, so they went up to a 62 millimeter version. But you can technically still use your 58 millimeter uh, filters with a step up ring. Of course, you may get some added vignetting. And even with the 62, they said on the wide angle lenses, the 24 mil on the latest 14 pros, you may still get slight vignetting. Personally, I don't believe I've really noticed anything, but uh, if you want to use 77 millimeter filters, you can use a step up ring from 62, and then there will be zero issues of vignetting for any sort of filters you use. So once you have all of your footage shot, the post-production workflow is incredibly easy. Now you can just send the footage straight to your computer and de-squeeze it in any of your favorite professional editors, but you can also de-squeeze it right inside of the Beast Cam app simply by hitting the convert button, and you can do it one at a time or select all the clips, do it all at once, and just kind of let it run its course. Now, of course, I'm shooting ProRes 60, and you may be wondering, what's that like to transfer to a computer? And all I'll say is, even though AirDrop is one of the best features Apple has ever come up with, it is not great for sending tens or possibly hundreds of gigs worth of ProRes footage. If you just need to do a couple clips, you're probably gonna be fine, but if you're like me and you transferred 75 clips for sample footage, it's going to fail almost every time. Instead, the best method is to plug in your phone to the computer and open image capture. Because for some reason, things like AirDrop or just importing them into like Finder or Photos, it tries to import them all at once and so, everything goes a little bit at a time, and if something runs into a problem, your computer restarts, the program quits, you have to start all over, where image capture will go one clip at a time. So for me, if I got to say clip 40 and had 35 clips left, and then something happened and everything crashed, when I got it going again, it would still only have 35 clips, and the 40 clips would already be saved. What I always find interesting at the end of these videos is where my opinion comes to like the use cases of mobile lenses. Because at the end of the day, yes, phone footage still looks like phone footage, but I often find it really just depends on what device you are watching this video on. My guess is if you're watching this on a large TV or a large computer monitor, you're probably looking at the footage going, it looks fine, but you know, I'm not gonna sell my mirrorless camera anytime soon. But statistically speaking, most people watch YouTube and social media on their phone. Here are all my stats for the devices people use to watch my channel. Shout out to like the 200 viewers on a Wii. And when viewing this footage on a smaller screen like a phone, it actually looks pretty impressive in my opinion. You're not seeing all the muddy pixels and post-processing that phones do to the footage while still being able to soak up all the 
fun characteristics that something like an anamorphic lens gives. I'd love to hear what you guys think about this lens and the footage itself. Again, all the gear I've used in this video will be linked down in the description below. And huge thanks to Bscript for sending out and sponsoring this video. Thanks to Cliff and Cajun for letting me come over, check out your studio and film you guys. And thank you for watching. See you in the next video.